AMI does a lot of trainings because um, what we found is if we're going to change healthcare, we need to have people that understand how to change healthcare. The willingness is there in the medical community. The understanding is not always there. Um, and the willingness is there in the chiropractic community and the understanding is not always there. So we've got to bring everybody to the same table, which is why we're doing all these different trainings. So what you were just in, that is a sales and marketing training. It was in that room and it's going to continue today. Yesterday we were teaching people how to um, do sales and how to actually do a public presentation to explain regenerative medicine. And then um, my wife's going to be in there today talking about marketing. We even did a section on branding yesterday, how to brand your clinic so that you have no competition. Um, my wife's going to be in there talking about our marketing plan that we use in our clinic in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We know 12 weeks out what's going to happen marketing-wise, and we can predict how many new patients are coming in in October right now. So we know there's a definite flow. In this model, you know, it, it's a new patient game. You're not trying to get maintenance patients and hang on to them. If you're a chiropractor, and most of you are chiropractors, there's an MD in here, right? The DO. The DO, okay, same, well, not same thing, but, but medical physician, how's that sound? So the chiropractors, I'm not saying you can't treat maintenance, but if you're gonna treat maintenance, how much does that work? What's a maintenance visit worth? Well, it's whatever you can collect for it, because you can't bill that to an insurance company, because all insurance made it very clear they're not covering maintenance. I believe in maintenance. I have a system for maintenance in my clinic in Chattanooga. I personally get maintenance. But a medically integrated practice is treating the people out there who are suffering, who don't know what else to do. And that is a whole different game. Your competition is a hip replacement, a knee replacement, a back surgery, a neck surgery. So you're in a different realm. And we're gonna to explain to you now how we do that and how you can actually position yourself. It will not be the same as a chiropractic office. And we'll show you how you do the transition as well. You can still, I mean, chiropractic is part of it. Everybody that comes in our clinic is chiropractic care. But it's a different setting. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just view this from the point of view that maybe if I want some, a different outcome, I gotta do something a little different. And that's what we do. So I'm gonna tell you the story of us and the history of us, but before I do, I wanna find out the story of you. So why don't you just, what, what I want you to do is I want you to share your dream. Tell us who you are, tell us where you're from, and tell me what your dream was. Everybody in this room at one point in their life, you might have been 10 years old, 15 years old, 18 years old, 30 years old, and you had this epiphany, because I was 25 when I had it. You had this epiphany, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to be when I grow up, and this is what my life will be like. This is what I found when I started looking, I realized, you know, was my current path going to get me to where I wanted to go? My dreams are different than your dreams. My dreams are different than my wife's dreams. Um, how long would it take? My goal, since the moment I got injured and I went the medical route, because I have family members that are vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies, different pharmaceutical companies, and the advice I was getting was to do, like I heard some of you saying, take the medication and just, and I had to go against the grain because I realized it wasn't going to fix me. And my goal became, when I got helped and I had severe headaches, you had the headaches, right? And I never told the chiropractor about it. I had that for years. But this neck injury is what he was treating and the headaches went away. I was like, holy crap, that was connected. I got injured because I had a neck problem, not I got a neck problem from getting injured. And so I had this epiphany. I'm giving up my career in marketing, my career in sales, which I was doing great, 25 years old, and brand new car, motorcycle, and, you know, I mean, everything. I, I was looking at houses. And I gave all that up to go back to school to become a chiropractor because I had a dream. And the dream was to change healthcare, to make chiropractic a more prominent position in healthcare. And now that's evolved a little bit, but it's still my dream. But what I've learned when I, when I had the opportunity to integrate and I was scared to do it, I've, I've learned over the last 25 years that just, you know, chiropractors, if, if I surveyed you guys in here, you'd probably agree with me. 80% of chiropractors went to school because they genuinely wanted to learn how to help people. And you heard that today in the dreams, right? And 20% go to school because they want to manipulate the system and just make a lot of money. Well, I found the same is true in the medical world. 80% of medical doctors and osteopaths went to school to genuinely learn how to help people. I was not taught that at life. 
I was taught at life, the medical doctor is the devil. And I was believing, believing it until I heard him say, and the physical therapist is the devil. And I'm like, I'm sleeping with one. She's not the devil. So I was open-minded enough to realize that maybe I was given false information. And I think the person who gave me that information was genuine and believed that, but he was given false information. I'm talking about Sid Williams, right? So I realized, you know what? If we all have a common purpose to help people, we should get those 80% of people together and change healthcare. And that's how my vision evolved. Because I realized as a chiropractor, no matter how hard we try, we're not getting over 10%. And you know why? Because the most powerful industry in the history of planet Earth is going to keep us below 10%. Why? The diffusion of innovation. How many of you ever heard of that? The diffusion of innovation. You got the, early, the innovators and you got the early adapters, and that means 15%. And until those people reach out and say, I'm going to do the service, and you know what? It's great. Then all of a sudden, the early majority starts going, I'll start doing it. And then you have this wave. You hit 15%, the wave starts, and it becomes an accepted therapy. The reason chiropractic in 132 years never became an accepted therapy is because the pharmaceutical industry says, and they know, we got to keep less than 10% going. We keep less than 10% going, they'll never take off. And boy, does that work. That's true. So what do you do? You create a different system that embraces people like him that are willing to work on the dark side without pushing pharmaceuticals and going more natural routes, understanding that the body has the secret of healing inside of it. And the doctor, just like Deepak Chopra said, a medical doctor, the doctor's job is to use that tool to get that body to heal itself. That has been forgotten in the pharmaceutical world. I know this because I go to barbecues with vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies. It's about the drug and being told, don't worry about the side effects, let the marketing department handle that. Where's your new product? I'm working on it, there's too many side effects. Don't worry about the side effects, let the marketing department handle it. That bull crap has to end. And how do you end it? You create a group of powerful people uniting the different professions together that all have a common objective and say, let's change it. And let's do it in a way, the only way this is going to work, the only way this is going to work is the participants are given a plan that will help them to thrive in their business and thrive in their goals. And yes, you will have to step out of the trenches of treating eventually and become the executive. You're relatively new in chiropractic practice, right? How many years? You're probably not given the idea of, like, I want to stop treating right now. But you go through a couple of shoulder surgeries, you beat your body up pretty good over the two, two decades or three decades you're doing this, and you go, I can't keep doing this until I drop dead on top of a patient at 80 years old, which is the plan that most chiropractors have right now. I'm going to have a heart attack on top of my patient, and that's how I'm going out. So you can't do that. What you got to do is realize that your brain is more important than your hands. And you need to teach what you know to others. That's the only way we're going to change it. And in doing that, for this plan to work, you have to thrive in all these categories. Family, relation, career, vacations, home, debt. You have to be super affluent if it's going to work. That's what AMI's plan is. That's what we're trying to do. We're, I will tell you this. We are creating a group. And I'm going to just show you a video. You were at our convention in Orlando. This is not that one. This was a couple years ago in New Jersey. Anybody know what this is? That's right. Very impressed. It's the cash flow of four quadrants. Yeah, I'm very impressed. So we're going to talk about this later, and it's disappearing, so I got it on the slide as well. But um, there's four types of people in, in the business world. There's employees, right? There's self-employed employees. There's business people and investors. The difference is these people work for their money. These people, the money works for them. And most people that are self-employed employee think they're a business person. And the, in his book, he says, what professions mostly are self-employed employees? Doctors. Doctors, that's right. He said, because they're perfectionists and they have to do it themselves because nobody can do it as good as them. And that's their downfall, that's why you can be a millionaire in any one of these quadrants, but if you're a self-employed employee, you are chained to your business, and your business will kill you. This happened to my dad. He was a self-employed employee, had his own business, worked for himself, he was his hardest boss, and what did he do? He retired at 55 and dropped dead at 60, 61. 
you know, worked his butt off all those years, 80 hour weeks. When he finally took time off, boom, done. Because he chained himself to his business. The business wouldn't function without him. We're going to talk about that. Oh, that's, how, that's how I felt, even when I was doing 700 business a week. You can be a very large personality-driven business. So how do, we, how do we get rid of the model that exists? We have to create a new model, and that's what we're doing. And we're creating it with a group, because I can't do it by myself. It's, just, it's not possible. So I tell you that because I am looking for recruits. That's what I'm doing here today. And I'm not going to sign all of you up, because I, don't, I might not want to sign all of you up. And you shouldn't join me. Some of you shouldn't join me because it might not be a good fit. But if it is a good fit, I'm going to try to recruit you because I need help. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to change health care. And I used to say to them, I have four daughters. And uh, my older two, they're all the same marriage. I have two that are older and two that are younger. We just built a couple businesses in the middle so we didn't have too many kids at that time. Um, but I used to tell my older girls, yeah, what I'm doing is changing health care, but I'll never see the change in my lifetime. I'm just working for future generations. But now... I tell my younger girls, it's going to happen in the next five, ten years. It's going to happen. And I, for the first time, I can see it. And it's not just me and it's not just AMI. There are groups that are starting to find each other and starting to realize, you know what? We can outpower the drug industry. And that's what we're looking to do. That's the only way we're going to change this. So that's where I came from. That's me growing up, family. We were Irish Catholic, right? What's the Irish Catholic form of birth control? <laughs> Pregnancy. Because you can't get pregnant when you're pregnant. So uh, eight kids in the family, and uh, just, you know, we, my father just worked his butt off. Never really a super rich guy, but um, had his own business, worked himself to death, and I decided I didn't want to make the same, same decision. You mentioned you were the first person to get a college degree in your family. I was the third. Myself, my brother, and my brother were the only ones to get a college degree. Um, salesman, 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 police officer, chiropractor. That's how the family goes. So um, that's where I came from. This is my newer family. And that's Colleen. You just met her. That's our four daughters. And I'm very, very blessed to have four beautiful daughters. And um, it's for them and their kids that I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I'm not happy with the way things are. And neither should you be. So I'll tell you a little bit about Colleen. She went to Marquette University. She graduated in 1984. She specialized in traumatic brain injury and stroke rehabilitation. Um, interestingly enough, you just heard we have a client in the next room who's a physical therapist who specializes in the same exact thing. And why do you think that particular brand of physical therapy would gravitate towards chiropractic? Because she was taught at Marquette University when she went to school there, don't ever work with a chiropractor. They didn't say anything about marrying one, but they said don't ever work with a chiropractor because they're not real doctors. And when I went to the chiropractor, she was going to protect me because she thought he was going to break my neck. But when she saw it, she immediately went, holy crap, these guys are doing something that nobody else is doing. This has to be part of mainstream healthcare. What made her think that? How do they wake people up out of a coma? Because 70% of her patients were in a coma when she got them. How do they do that? They do it in a team environment. And when they do it, what they do, because there's different professions, there's a speech therapist, cognitive therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, under the direction of a physiatrist. That exact model is what we copied for AMI, having the, the medical overseeing the different professions, including chiropractic, because that's the way it has to be. Um, but here's what they did. When I learned this, and I didn't figure this out until I was a chiropractor, she figured out right away, I just wasn't smart enough to even understand if she explained it to me what it was. They would put them on a tilt table. They would take that comatose patient and strap them in with a head strap, an upper body strap, a mid body strap, a leg strap so they wouldn't buckle. They put them on a plate and put them in a weight bearing position twice a day. What does that do? Proprioception. It loads the weight bearing joints. And when you load weight bearing joints, you stimulate proprioceptors. And what do proprioceptors do? They stimulate a process in the brain called synaptogenesis. You start making synapses, which is shortcuts that connect different parts of the brain. And they're not trying to repair the damaged part of the brain. They're trying to reattach the highways that were going through that part of the brain so the other parts of the brain can still co communicate. They're never going to get them 100%, but they're going to improve them, and they do it through physical medicine. They would get them sometimes on a ball while they're in a coma, and they'd roll them around on a ball, putting their body in different positions, loading and unloading weight-bearing joints. So when she saw chiropr chiropractic, she went like this. 90% of the weight-bearing joints are right there and they get stuck. 
and nobody else is on, well, maybe osteopaths, but nobody else is on sticking them. She was like, there's science to this. This works. I mean, we, she went from the extreme of a family with two vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies in it, a mother's a nurse, a sister's a nurse, she's a physical therapist, to the only doctor is going to be present when my kids are born is going to be me. I'm like, really? I was a little bit nervous. And um, my kids were not going to get immunized. And they still haven't been immunized. My, my third daughter, this one, just graduated high school. She got accepted at Hofstra University, um, which is a tough school to get into. She has like a 3.8 average. And last minute, we just canceled it. Do you know why? Because New York just passed an immunization law. All students, even in college, have to have every immunization there is, including flu shots. And we're like, well, Kirsten, you can go to Hofstra if you want, but you're getting immunized on your dime, not ours, because we will not put that crap in your body. And she's like, I'm not doing that either. So she turned it down. When we were looking for a university, we found out, like at NYU, New York University, they told her, look, if you want to be a medical doctor, if you sign an agreement that you'll be a family practitioner, your tuition is free. And not because you got a, a um, scholarship, it's free because there's not enough family practitioners because they're quitting in droves. Am I right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I, when I graduated school in 1991, there was almost 700,000 medical doctors in the United States. Now there's 540,000. They are quitting in droves. Why are they quitting? Because they're tired of the crap of going through and having to just prescribe drug after drug after drug. That standard of care was set up by the AMA, and I'm going to show you today why we shouldn't trust the AMA, and the AMA is not medical doctors. So, fast forward a little bit, she has this epiphany, and all of a sudden she's like, this is a science and this is a treatment that is necessary. It's why you, we heard some of these fantastic stories about things that happen to people that have these untreatable things, and all of a sudden they get treated with chiropractic and they get, they get better, right? That should be part of mainstream healthcare. And if it was, we'd need a lot less drugs, which is why it's not part of mainstream healthcare. Because mainstream healthcare is run by who? The drug companies. So we, we have this in, insane drive. I've never let up on it, which is why Inc. Magazine, I'm like, they want to interview me? Now, they didn't put my picture on the cover. They took a look at me and said, we'll put Mark Cuban on the cover. But I was in that article, 25 small companies that are changing the world. And it talked about how we're charging into healthcare and, and this was written right as Obamacare was playing in un unraveled, and they're like, everybody's fleeing health care. Why is this guy charging in? Because I'm going to change it. Right? So we actually, you know what the Inc. 5000 list is? The Inc. 5000 list, Inc. Magazine looks at 5,000 of the fastest growing companies out of 28 million companies in the United States. And they rank it every year. So in 2018, number 1,003. 1,303 was advanced medical integration. Because, I'm not trying to brag, oh, we're great. This is a movement. I want you to understand, if you join with us, it's not just signing on with a consultant. This is a movement. I am recruiting for a movement to change healthcare. That's why you see those guys getting like, yesterday some were in tears talking about some of the things they've seen change in healthcare since they've been doing this model, right? So we just got notified this week this year, we're number 2,582, which we're not going down. It's extremely hard to hit this two years in a row. It's based on your growth, not based on how, it's not the Fortune 500, it's based <coughs> on how much you're growing. So second year in a row, they sent us a letter and said, here's the companies you're in, in uh, who've also done it two years in a row. Microsoft, Chobani Yogurt, um, Vizio. We're like, holy crap. So we're growing, we're gonna hit it again next year. That's our goal. We're gonna hit it again the year after that. That's our goal. Because we got to grow to change healthcare. This is a movement. Do you understand that? I'd rather you find out now and go, I don't want to be part of a movement, than to join us and go, this is a little bit too much rah rah for me because I never let up. Okay? Your greatest barrier to success is the fear of failure. And that is true. You're looking right now, every one of you just said you're looking to try to expand your business in some way to offer more services. Your biggest barrier to that is going to be this, the fear of failure. But you know what? You, you can't just say, oh, I'm not going to do it because I could possibly fail. If we did that, we'd be doing this by candlelight. Because how many times did Edison fail? 1,400 times. And when he asked him, well, aren't you embarrassed that you failed at just 1,400 times? He said, no. 
I figured 1,400 ways not to make a light bulb. It's all in how you look at it. Everything is viewpoint. It's all in how you look at it. This is outside the box thinking. We are a movement that is going to change healthcare, and I am recruiting because I need help. So, Napoleon Hill, how many read this book? Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. The rest of you should read this book because I didn't read it because I didn't like the title for years. <coughs> Think and Grow Rich. I was told about this before I was even a chiropractor. Think and Grow Rich. It sounds like it's all money oriented. It's not. He, this guy, Napoleon Hill, was a prodigy. He was a writer and he became a reporter at 14 years old. And he was um, fortunate enough when he was very young to interview a guy named Andrew Carnegie. You ever heard of him? And what Carnegie did was he said, he kept asking him, why are you successful, why are you successful? And Carnegie, I guess, took a liking to him and said, look, you're a pretty bright kid. I'm going to introduce you to the most powerful people in the world. And then you're going to write a book and answer that question. So he introduced him to um, Firestone, Ford, Edison, Schwab, Wanamaker, uh, four presidents of the United States. He actually, Napoleon Hill ended up serving on the cabinet, the economic advisor for FDR in the Great Depression. So this guy, like this book was, how do these 500 people, what makes them successful? And his conclusion was, it's the way they think. They think differently than most people. They do not entertain negative thoughts. They, a lot of them even did drills to keep negative thoughts out of their head. Everything is possible. Everything is possible. That's what makes them the super, the most probably the, that era was, I mean, he interviewed Rockefeller, and you just go on and on and on with this list. Incredible people. And he said they all think differently than the average person, which is why their, their dreams came to fruition, and their dreams after their dreams were like things they couldn't even conceive when they were little. That's happened in my career. My dreams that I had when I was younger, when I was growing up, I already passed them like over a decade ago. I'm working on new dreams, and that's what you should be doing working on new dreams, because that's the people who change the world, and the world needs a change. Um, Wallace Swaddle. We went over this yesterday. How many of you read this book? You should write that down or take a picture of it. Wallace Swaddle, The Science of Getting Rich. He wrote this before Napoleon Hill wrote his book, and Napoleon Hill read this book, and this is much shorter and easier to read. And he, The Science of Getting Rich. How do you get rich? I'll sum it up for you right now. It's so simple. And it's so simple, it's one of those things where you keep thinking about it and go, you know what, he's right. You know what, he's right. And the more you think about it, you go, yeah, he's right. He's right. He just basically said, as long as what you're giving your customers is more valuable than what they give you, you'll get rich. As long as what you're giving your customer is more valuable than what they give you, you will get rich. And you think about that. What do you give your customer? What did the chiropractor give you at eight years old? Was it more valuable than what your parents paid for it? He should be rich. This is a science. And if you apply that, it works. When you're selling stem cells at $5,000 an injection, you're not selling $5,000 worth of stem cells. You're serving the ability of that person to chase down their grandkids who can't do it now. And their, their daughter said, Dad, you can't watch them anymore because Johnny fell down the steps because you couldn't get to him fast enough. You're, you're giving that chiropractor the ability to go back and adjust because he fixed his shoulder after surgery. You're giving that, that guy who had the open heart surgery, if you look on TED Talks, there are cardiologists saying, we found out putting stem cells into the pericardium prevents the scar tissue regrowth after surgery, which is like a vice on the heart, which is why I had a cardiologist working for me. He's like, that's why all my patients died. You cut them open, it's like, let's put a scar tissue jacket on your heart and see if it'll survive. They never survive. They just die slow. That's what a cardiologist told me working in my practice. Cardiothoracic surgeon. So time's got to change. We have all the ingredients on the table right now to change it. Right now. The, the, the medical community is getting fed up. The medical community is like looking for answers. And who's going to give them the answers? You guys are. The pioneers, including you. That's why you know, the neurologist said to me yesterday, he said, I, I really hate speaking in front of people, but I feel like it's my duty to talk to you guys. I'm like, all right, we'll let you talk tomorrow morning. Okay, good. He wanted to say something because he's like, this is incredible. This is like changing my viewpoint on everything. Now's the time to change this, and we have it within our ability to do it. So you got to look at it as if life is a game. I heard somebody say you played soccer and you played hockey and you played different games, right? 
What's exciting about a game? If you went and played soccer, and every time you got the ball, you kicked that ball, score. And then one time somebody threw the ball in and hit you on the head, score. And you tripped one day and you kicked the ball, score. And every time you got the puck, you just said you could look at backwards with a golf club, score, right? Would you keep playing? There's no challenge. The excitement of the game is the challenge. The possibility that you could lose. That's the excitement of the game. I'm looking for game players. Because this is the best game you could ever play. What a noble game you could play. You could change healthcare. The only way it can be done is grassroots, individually, one at a time in all the communities, and get it so that it's so standard that people start going, you know, before I get that surgery, I think I'm going to do the standard thing and go see if I can go to one of these clinics that helps me avoid drugs and surgery. So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at the condition of healthcare right now. And all of us in this room, whether an office manager or a chiro or an osteopath or whatever we are, physical therapist, we are in healthcare. So this is the product of our professions. And we are part of that, so we're responsible for it. Is America healthy? Got a bunch of no's. Any yeses? Let's take a look. That's opinions, and I like to look at stats. So we heard a couple stats. I'm going to share some stats with you. The United States is actually 4.6% of the world's population. We consume, we spend more on health care than the other 95.4 combined. Did you know that? Every year. Our price tag for health care is by far the most expensive in the entire world. We consume 75% of the world's medication. We were 55 and opioids pushed us to that level because we consume 95% of the world's opioids. The United States, 4.6% of the world's population, consumes 95% of the world's opioids. 95%. If you look at how our healthcare compares, this is from the, um, what's OECD? I keep forgetting what that is. Organization, Organization of Economic Deve Cooperation and Development. This is from the United Nations. So basically what they did was they ranked the top 25 countries in the world, and this line is life expectancy, and this line is cost of per citizen for health care, and who's definitely fallen off the scale worse and worse every year? The United States. Lowest life expectancy, most expensive health care. This is 2014. You know what happened in 2015? This number went over $10,000. You know what happened in 2015? 16 and 17, life expectancy went down. First time since World War I. Why did life expectancy go down three years in a row in World War I? Because we had a war and a, a, the Spanish flu epidemic. And we're now worse than that. And it looks like it's going to go down again next year. This is like incredibly bizarre stats that our life expectancy in the most developed country who spends more on health care than the entire rest of the world combined is getting the worst results. Now, the life expectancy is almost a decade apart between Japan and the United States. That's ridiculous. And look what they're spending on health care, and now we're over here on health care. It is ridiculous. It is appalling. I am ashamed that I am part of health care, and that's just that. But I accept responsibility for it, because if I don't, See, if I don't say this is my fault, I become a victim. If I say this is my fault, I fix it. And that's what I'm doing. Do you understand that? This was on the, I was in Atlanta speaking and I saw this, I got the paper, this was a year ago, Christmas. And um, who are they blaming for the opioid crisis? They struggle to rein in those bad doctors. No, that's bull crap. If you look at my book back there, I got a whole chapter in how they greased the palms of Congress to make this the standard of care. And those bad doctors are just following orders. <clears throat> you look at it, you, what they did was they said, this was from not, this is 2016. How many opioid prescriptions per 100 people are occurring per state? So I looked at Alabama, 121 per 100 people. I went, well, I'm in Tennessee, it's 107 per 100 people. You look at the national average, it's 70. 70 opioid prescriptions per 100 people. Are you friggin' me? Excuse my language. But I get pretty passionate. 
how the hell did that happen? How the hell did opioids, it's now 90%, become the leading cause of death of Americans under the age of 50? And that is officially the leading cause of death in the United States under the age of 50. Opioids. And they start with a prescription. This is the amount of people who die from drug deaths in the world. This is the United States, and this is everybody else. It's not even close. It's not even close. And the, you know, the, the media leads you to believe that we're attacking this problem, right? Because there's a lot of stuff about opioids, opioids, opioids. And they just released one that's a thousand times stronger than anything else on the market. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You look at how they did it, the Sackler brothers, and how they paid off Congress to do it, to make a standard of care. And when did they start doing this? In the 1990s. And they made, uh, as of 16, $35 billion pushing opioids. $35 billion. You look at this and you go, all right, so along comes Barbara Starfield. How many of you ever heard of her? Nobody? You should take a picture of this. Barbara Starfield was the, a medical doctor and a master's of public health and the department head of health policy and management at Johns Hopkins University Medical School. So that's the nation's medical school. And what she did was she wrote an article in July of 2000 and she published this in the Journal of the American Medical Association and she asked that question, is America healthy? How effective is our healthcare system? And the way she did the study, she took the top 13 industrialized nations in the world and she compared them in 200 different categories of health, like cancer and heart disease and heart attack and or, or car accidents and smoking and alcoholism and all these different categories and ranked them from 1 to 13 to see who is the healthiest and who is the unhealthiest. Where do you think we came in? 13th place. 95% of the categories. We took last place in 95% of the categories. It's like that she discovered we're the most diabetic country in the world. In fact, you have a two and a half times greater chance of being a diabetic because you live in the United States. How did that happen? So she published this in JAMA, and here's what the first thing she discovered. She said, the leading cause of death, I'm sorry, the third leading cause of death in the United States is the side effects of medical treatment, officially. And here's how she broke it down. 225,000 deaths per year from the treatment. And she said, 106,000 Americans die from the side effects of properly prescribed drugs. Not mistakes, not overdoses, not drugs interacting, but everything's done right, and 106,000 Americans die every year. Now, we, died, we lost 55,000 soldiers in 10 years in Vietnam, and that's every year. She said 80,000 Americans go into a hospital, catch an infection in the hospital they didn't have, and the infection kills them. 12,000 people die from surgery they should have never have gotten, 7,000 die from medication errors, and 20,000 die from other errors in the hospital. And then she said this, I only looked at deaths in a hospital setting, not in private practice and not in nursing homes. And in the hospital setting, it is highly encouraged to underreport deaths from medical treatment. I'll give you an example. My father had cancer, and he was getting chemotherapy, and it metastasized to his brain. So they put a shunt in his brain, and they said, we're going to give a dose of chemotherapy straight into his brain, and that'll fix him up. And what happened? He goes right into a coma, lays in a bed in a coma for two weeks, and dies. What killed him? Chemotherapy. What was the official cause of death? Pneumonia. He survived cancer. His lungs filled up when he was in a coma, so he died of pneumonia. Do you see how they fudge stats? And she said, if you take that out of the equation, it's probably the leading cause of death, which there was just a study just published, it was handed to me yesterday, haven't read it yet, that says, Actually, the accurate number of people dying from medical treatment in the United States is over 900,000 Americans a year. A million people a year being killed by health care. And our health care costs more than the entire rest of the world combined. Isn't that appalling? You, are, did I like blow you guys? You're all just sitting there like this. But is that too much for you? Am I too intense? Because you should know this. I never let up. This is me all the time. I'm changing healthcare. I'm not going to keep doing, participating in this crap. So her study was repeated in 2013, this time by the National Institutes of Health. And what they did was they looked at 17 countries. And unfortunately, Dr. Starfield couldn't be in this study because in 2011, she was given a drug that interacted with another drug that her other doctor didn't know she was taking, and she died. 
The exact thing she reported is what killed her. So in this study, this time, same study, same categories. I read the entire thing from beginning to end. It was tough to stay awake. We took last place in 90% of the categories. Overweight, 17th place. Body mass index, 17th place. Diabetes, infant mortality. Infant mortality. How well does a baby survive the first year of life? That's that stat. We took last place. They found third world countries where a baby has a better chance of surviving life than the United States. And we pay more for that position than every other country in the world combined. Imagine if you were, we were all race car drivers and we all have our own cars and we race. And my car costs more than all of your cars combined. And every time we race, I come in last. What would you tell me to do? Quit racing. Unfortunately, that's the exact position that we find ourselves in in healthcare.